The 10th year of prophecy was the single most difficult year in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had a very difficult life, especially after he becomes a Prophet. So what made this year so difficult? Well, the scholars of Sirah say there were three things that happened during this year. The first of them was the death and the passing away of his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. His wife for 25 years, the mother of his children, and also, you know, his strongest companion. She was like the rock in his life and she supported him uh, with her wealth, and she supported him with, you know, her um, in her capacity as a wife and as a mother of his children. And when she passed away, that year, the tenth year, became so difficult for him. The other thing that happened is that his uncle then passed away as well, and Abu Talib was like a father to him because when his father passed away, um, the person wasn't even born yet. Then his uncle, uh, his grandfather rather. Abdul Muttalib, he passes away when he's eight years old. Then he goes into the care of his uncle Abu Talib, uh, and he, in his care, he grows up. So from year he's eight years old, and now and his uncle is passing away. This is a huge time here that he spent with him. He enjoyed his company. He was, you know, um, brought up by him, nurtured by him, and on top of that, Abu Talib became his defender as well. So Quraysh, when they saw that the Prophet was publicly talking about Islam, they wanted to attack him. They wanted to uh, shut him down. But it was because of Abu Talib, who was like a chieftain, that they couldn't do it because Abu Talib said, look, this is my nephew and no one is going to say anything to him. And so until he was alive, the Prophet had this kind of protection. Now, the saddest thing about him passing away wasn't that he lost that protection, um, even though that was the case that his life would become automatically so much harder but it was actually because he passed away as a non-muslim as a mushrik an idol worshiper and that is one of the real difficult things that the person had to come to terms with that he loved me he helped me he protected me he defended my message and yet he still did not accept islam now the third reason why this year was particularly difficult and is known as a year of sadness was because the person then after he, lo he lost Abu Talib, he knew that he had to look for a new place for his followers, a place that they would give, be given safety and a sanctuary and maybe those people would help him uh, in his message. So he reached out to the people of Taif and he went there hoping to be um, either received uh, you know, with warm arms and accepting his message or at least the idea of being given safety for his followers. So when he goes there, he's in the company of the three chiefs of Taif, and they are three brothers. And um, unfortunately, they do not take too kindly to the process. And in fact, they begin to be very obnoxious towards him. One of the brothers says, you know, I can't talk to you. If you are a prophet, then you're too holy for me. And if you're not, then, you know, you're too despicable for me to, to talk to. Another of the brothers says, you know, couldn't God send a better man as a prophet than you like that? And so the person realizes that they're not going to accept my message. And in fact, uh, they're more like my enemies. So he says, well, if you're not going to accept my message, then at least do not tell the Quraysh, because if they find out that I have left them to come to seek an uh, you know, alliance with you, this is like treason, and they will they'll, you know, most probably harm my followers even more. But even then, these three chieftains, they would, wouldn't even entertain that. Instead, they told him to go. Uh, so the person, he's leaving, and you know the story, um, that uh, the rabble rousers and the people on the street, they begin to taunt him and eventually they start to like, give him chase and even the kids come out uh, and they start to throw pebbles at him and stones at him and now the person is being hurt and he's being, uh, you know, as they land, they, they, they inflict wounds on him and he starts to bleed and as he's leaving Baif now, his blood from his blessed body is trickling down his legs and making his sandals become uh, wet with his blood, uh, with his blood, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet is in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, his mind is all over the place, and he finds himself in the courtyard of a house, and in that garden, he sits down, he thinks about what's happened, he raises his hands to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and he speaks to Allah, and he makes this amazing du'a known as the du'a of Taif, and he begins by saying, Allahumma, O oh Allah. Ashku ilayka Oh Allah, I complain to you 
about the weakness of my situation. Who will you entrust me to now? And um, will you entrust me to these people here who have stoned me out? Will you entrust me to the Quraysh who have abused me there as well? And then he says, Anta arham rahimin You are the most merciful of those who show mercy. You are Rabbul Mustadafin. You are the master of those who are downtrodden. He's talking about himself now and his people. And then at the end he says, If you would, if 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 this is because you are angry with me, then I can't take it. But if you're not angry with me, then it doesn't matter. Then he ends by saying, but if you were to make things easy for me, then that will be better. Now this beautiful dua, uh, it teaches us a number of things. First and foremost, he opened up by saying, I complain to you Allah about my situation. And he spoke about how the Quraysh were treating him bad, how the people of Baif had uh, turned their back on him. And that is one beautiful way to make dua to Allah, that you speak to Allah and you complain about everything that's going wrong in your life. You're not complaining about Allah, you're complaining to Allah. And Allah loves to hear that from his slave. Like uh, Ya'qub salam, he would complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. We should do that. The other amazing thing about the dua is that uh, the Prophet salam, he had such positive thoughts about Allah. He was saying, you are the most merciful of merciful. You are the Lord of those who are downtrodden. As if to say that it doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter that I'm suffering right now and that things are not going my way. I still see you in the best of light. I see you as the Lord who will take care of me, who will protect me, who will show me mercy, who will uh, you know, relieve me from the situation. And that shows us that when we are in difficult situations, when we are experiencing hardship, we shouldn't allow that to redefine our assumptions about Allah. Now, a lot of people do this where they go through difficulty in their life, a trauma happens, and automatically they start to blame Allah and to think the worst about Allah and become very pessimistic about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's plan for them. The Prophet wasn't like that. Uh, and, the, and the last thing is that he made the request about what he wanted, which was, if you would make something this easy for me, then that would be better at the end of the dua. Where usually when we make dua, we say, Oh Allah, please give me the job. Oh Allah, I want to get married. Oh Allah, I need this money. And you make that the first thing and usually the only thing. Where here the Prophet is making the request at the end of the dua. Why? Because you know, when you speak to a king, you don't just say, I want this. You speak to the king, you, you celebrate his highness, you uh, you know, speak to him, you show your vulnerability, your desperation, your need, and then at the end you say, and if you could and that would be so much better for me. And this is how you speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, what do we know? An angel comes to the Prophet and says, you know, you give me the order and I'll send these two mountains upon each other and crush them. And the Prophet says, no, I don't want that to happen because perhaps from their children will come those who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even after they had done what they had done, the Prophet still didn't want them to be destroyed because he didn't want people to like him. He wasn't trying to win people's hearts so they would like him better. He wanted to get people to worship Allah. And if he had to suffer in the process, that's all well and good. You know, and that's the way we should look at people as well. It's not about what I want, it's about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Alhamdulillah.